All right, so we are looking at nutrition today, or at least we're, we're looking at the introduction to nutrition. There's a, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to nutrition, so um, we definitely won't get to all of it in, in one PowerPoint, but this is going to be kind of an overview. It's kind of funny, like this PowerPoint's, it's a little weird, because uh, it doesn't say anything that isn't going to be repeated in the rest of this course. Like it, it is going to kind of lay out and say like, um, some general information about nutrition, but it doesn't get like super specific about anything. Um, it's kind of a broad overview. Uh, the more specific stuff is obviously what we'll get into through the rest of this course. Um, but it's kind of interesting. It, it, I don't, the, I don't know if they had like a different person write this class, but like it's a, it's a unique take. It doesn't uh, feel like a lot of the other PowerPoints, but. Um, I will say one thing that is important, we are talking a little bit about the concept of sports nutrition in this course. Um, now, sports nutrition is going to be technically a specialized area of nutrition. Um, you guys are going to have two nutrition classes at Sochi. There is this one, uh, which we are currently in, and then there is going to be another one when you get to Capstone. So Mo is going to actually prep you for passing your nutrition coaching exam. Uh, my job is to kind of give you general nutrition information that you're gonna find in your standard textbook. Um, so like the broad overview of everything related to nutrition. Um, so uh, a very specialized area of study um, and it's definitely going to partner very closely with obviously, you know, exercise science, right? Um, so. Uh, the idea here, when we talk about sports nutrition versus like regular nutrition, right? Uh, we are either trying to provide fuel for physical activity. Uh, we're trying to repair and, you know, well, facilitate repair, uh, and fix the body, right? We're getting enough protein in, uh, and optimize our athletic performance. Now that also has to do with like, you know, either a reduction or increase in calories as well, right? We, we need to talk a little bit about like how energy is, is either coming into the body or leaving the body, right? It all has to, to kind of come together. Um, you know, if I'm trying to lose weight, then I need to burn more energy uh, than I can, uh, than I'm bringing in each day, right? Um, and that way my body is going to have to metabolize something else in order to, to, to kind of make up for that. So in order for us to understand uh, and apply these nutrition concepts, we have to have a pretty good idea of general nutritional information, which we'll be going over in this course, um, how that sort of interacts scientifically with some of the chemistry inside of our body, how, you know, sort of where biology and chemistry come together, um, how to apply nutrition concepts uh, to our clients, like how do we translate that scientific information into practical lessons? Because here's the thing, you know, your clients do not want the chemistry breakdown. <laughs> like I love to be like, well, here's what's happening with the carbohydrate. And my clients are like, nope, quiet, nope, too much info. All I want to know is what to eat. <laughs> um, so we do need to kind of know how to break that down. Now, um, this has never been more, uh, you know, applicable in terms of a sentence, but the way my roommate always puts it, he's like, he doesn't want to know how the sausage is made, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, that could not be more true of, of nutrition. So we need to kind of apply it practically. Um, so, uh, as nutritionists, and that's the thing, guys, you guys are walking away with, uh, this certification right here. If you go to nasm.org, you know, uh, and this is this is more of like Mo's part of things more than mine. Um, but you guys are gonna get uh, if I go to the specializations here, where is it? Uh, nutrition coach. Uh, you guys are getting the CNC, the Certified Nutrition Coach. So what that is gonna mean is that you are officially certified as a nutritionist. Now I do want to be really clear here, and say this right off the bat. Um, so as a nutritionist, you are an expert in the field of nutrition. And you are allowed to educate people about nutritional concepts as much as you want. You can break things down specifically for the client, but what you cannot do is you cannot tell them what to eat. And that sounds as if that's impossible to talk about nutrition without telling someone what to eat. What I mean is like, you can tell someone that broccoli is very good and very good for them. What you cannot do is say, Carlos, I want you to eat a cup of broccoli every day. That's something I am not allowed to do. That is a prescription. 
Yeah, because I was I had that was gonna be my question too. Literally was gonna ask that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the way it works uh is you are allowed to like educate, right? You're allowed to like be like, look, broccoli is super good for you, it's rich in vitamin C and fiber. Um, it adds bulk to your diet. You know, it's it's got a lot of other B vitamins and you know, iron in it, and it's got all these like amazing things. And like if you were to eat broccoli, like you know, a cup a day would be really good for someone like you, right? So you see what I I, I said it would be good. I, I framed it, and what I did is I left the ball in your court. What I didn't do was say, eat this. Here's a meal plan that I whipped up for you that's gonna be really good. Now, can I make meal plans? Absolutely. I can make a meal plan and I can give it to people as long as I am framing it as this is a generally good meal plan. This is not a prescription for Al. So food in the US is considered medicine. It actually falls under a medicinal category. So there are only two people in the US that are allowed to give someone specific diet plans, custom catered to them uh, specifically. And that is going to be dietitians which are not the same as nutritionists, dietitians, and doctors. Those are the only two people who can actually like specifically give someone a meal plan that they customized for them. Otherwise, you are stepping outside of what we call our scope of practice. Um, you are stepping into something you're not an expert in because we are an expert in nutrition, but we are not an, ex uh, an expert in nutrition prescription. That's the distinction, right? We are an expert on nutrition as a concept, but we are not experts in how to uh, prescribe it to other people because we aren't medical back because we are not a medical background. So for the record in the, and, and, and the reason this is important, the reason like this, the way this is going to work is let's say, uh, let's say you do give somebody like a meal plan or something and you go up and, you know, and, and then all of a sudden that person gets sick, right? They develop diabetes, right? Uh, something happens. And they go up in front of a, a judge, though, you know, I'm going to sue you, right? They go up in front of a judge and the judge is going to go, all right, are you an expert on nutrition? And you're going to go, yes, I am. And he's going to go prove it. And so you're going to show them the nutrition certifications that you have. And they're going to analyze it and say, well, this makes you an expert on nutrition. It does not make you an expert on prescriptive nutrition. You don't know how to, you know, we don't know how to uh, apply it to, to actual individuals. The only people that know how to do that, dietitians and doctors, right? And that's what they are trained specifically for. Um, so like you are going to be held liable in this scenario. Now, if you go up in front of a judge and they say like, you know, they're like I got sick because I followed this guy's meal plan that he gave me and you show them that like it, you know, on your meal plan, you have like a sent an asterisk at the bottom that says like, look, this is an example meal plan. I didn't tell you to eat this every day, but you did eat it every day. You know, uh, you know, it was, this is meant to be an example, right? You can swap this out for that. This is one of the reasons why if you go to a place like Jenny Craig or, uh, you know, my fit foods or any of those companies that are like, you know, pre-made meal kits and stuff. Um, you can go to those places and talk to them about like weight loss and be like, Hey, my goal is to lose weight. My goal is to gain weight. They can help you run your numbers and be like, this is how many calories you, you know, need to eat every day. Like they can do that for you. And then they can say, you know, you need uh, the blue meal plan, right? Because the blue meal plan is, there's a lot of choice that you're going to make within that. It doesn't tell you specifically that it's it's X, Y, or Z, right? Or they would put you on the green meal plan, right? Like everybody's gonna be a little bit different. They can do that because it's general nutritional advice. That's fine. We are allowed to give general nutritional advice. So we are allowed to say, this is a really good meal plan. 100% we are allowed to do that. What we are not allowed to do is say, I want you to eat this every day. That's the distinction. Um, just, on, and honestly, it's kind of funny. I, I feel this way. I had this conversation with my girlfriend uh, yesterday. No, I didn't see my girlfriend yesterday. I was, I work all day. Uh, <laughs> the day before, oh no, I did. No, yeah, because I dropped her off before work. Uh, anyway, so I was having this conversation with Lindsay yesterday and uh, we were talking about how like, you know, um, uh, the different, like, like I consider like, like doctors are experts on health, but they're, and, and they can give advice 
to like get physically active. But if a doctor were to like take their client to the gym and be like, this is how you should do your squats. This is how many squats you should do. And they like assembled them like a workout routine, that doctor would actually be held liable. And like, you know, they have all those freaking certificates and, 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 and diplomas and, and piece of paper and licenses on their walls, right? Doctors are, are so heavily certified. But if they were to actually like do that and be like, you know, this is how you want to do this exercise, that would be outside of their scope of practice and they would get in trouble. The same way that we would get in trouble if we give someone a specific meal plan and say like, you know, this is what I want you to eat. What we can do is say, this is a generally good meal plan and we can guide people there. I, the phrase I always use, and I'm going to use this a lot next mod actually as well, when we're talking about uh, behavior change, the, 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 the sentence I always use is you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Now, normally that phrase is talking about like a stubborn person, you know, <laughs> like you can do everything to help people, but you can't, you can't help somebody who can't, won't help themselves. You know what I mean? Uh, in our case, it's like advice. <laughs> you should lead the horse to water, pave the road, clear it, light it with lights and be like, put giant signs or like, go this way, horse. Like you can do that hundred percent, but you can't dunk its head into the water. <laughs> like if you do that you're stepping outside of your scope of practice you're prescribing food and now uh, now you're held liable so that's the the distinction we'll we'll make that continually clear uh through the rest of this course but that's that's what the so what we are uh when it comes to nutrition is we are what was what is known as an evidence-based practitioner meaning that like we are relying on uh, generally what has worked for most people throughout the years and what is the considered the most effective uh, uh, research that has been done currently to date, right? Uh, that's the thing, right? We're looking for, you know, um, uh, uh, the best information now. There might be better information later, right? Um, so this is where we are looking at like nutrition, right? I mean, like, you know, you go back uh, uh, 50 years ago, right? And it was like, what's the healthiest breakfast? It's like, ah, oh, good hearty breakfast of steak and eggs, you know? <laughs> um, and that's not necessarily always true. So I have got a fun video to show you today, just to kind of highlight what I mean when I talk about this. Uh, I always look forward to this day uh, and I always look forward to showing this video because this is not, for the record, this is not, a nutritional video. This is not an educational video. <laughs> this is a comedy sketch. <laughs> but, 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 but it is um, really cool uh, uh, because the, this comedy sketch kind of highlights what our approach to nutrition really means. Um, so let's see here. Eggs. Uh, it's not college humor. It's funny or die. All right. <laughs> I already showed the sound. Yeah, I did. Okay, here we go. I love this. Dish. I'm traveling dietitian. <laughs> oh, you're terrible. Wait! <laughs> Stop! Don't eat that food! <laughs> What are you doing in our house? I'm from the future. I'm here to warn you, don't eat that food. Why not? The eggs, they're full of cholesterol. What? Cholesterol, it, it clogs up your arteries. Eating even just one egg can dramatically increase your chance of heart attack. Don't eat eggs. Oh my God, thank you. You're welcome. Godspeed. Well, I guess I better take those eggs. Wait! Stop! You're back! Yeah. We were wrong about the eggs. How? Well, it turns out there's two types of cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, and eggs actually have both. So you can eat eggs, but just don't eat the egg yolks. So stick with the egg whites. Thank <laughs> Yes, thank you. Yeah. Godspeed! The 
Yeah. Yeah, okay, so it turns out that the amount of cholesterol in a food doesn't actually affect how much cholesterol ends up in your blood. <laughs> the eggs are probably fine. In fact, we sort of don't even know what cholesterol is. But the steak! You can't eat the steak! Why not? Turns out that red meat increases your chance of heart attack. You have to cut out red meat. So no steak! Thank you. Godspeed. What? No, no steak, mister. What? Wait! <laughs> we were wrong about the steak. It's the toast. Man was not meant to eat bread. What do you mean, man was not meant to eat bread? Well, if you think about it, human beings should really only be eating what our Paleolithic ancestors ate. So, therefore, no bread, no toast. How do you know what our Paleolithic ancestors ate? Well, we, we just have to guess, right? I mean, we don't have any way of knowing what... <laughs> Okay, went back to the Paleolithic. They are not doing well. I don't know what we were thinking. If anything, we should all be eating a lot more bread. <laughs> Jeez, so I guess just um, ignore everything I've said and exercise. Exercise, okay. Yeah, yeah, you guys could probably use it. You've been just sitting here for the last 35 years. It's been five minutes. Right. Time travel. All right, well, Godspeed! Turns out it's genetic. Doesn't matter whether you exercise or what you eat. I'm sorry I ruined your meal. I need 10 minutes. Do you want some eggs? I'd love some. <laughs> so I love that video because that video kind of perfectly summarizes what it's like to talk about nutrition. You know, like the the current like when that video came out, the the you know they were kind of making a dig at paleo diets, right? Because paleo was so freaking popular when CrossFit was just coming out, and like um, <laughs> everybody doing CrossFit was doing paleo. And uh, I would get questions about the paleo diet all the time. And here's the thing, the paleo diet is good for you in general. Um, like the, you know, the idea of like eating all natural, naturally occurring foods, like who's going to argue and say that like, that's a bad idea, you know, but uh, it does have like a couple rules that are in there that kind of don't make it like, it's like, oh, well, you don't want to eat legumes of any type, like no peanuts, no beans, no, you know, stuff like that, because they are, um, what is the reason, uh, the, what do they have is the, uh, hold on, uh, paleo and beans. Why is it, uh, they have lectins and phytic acid in them, which theoretically didn't wasn't like a thing it, back in the day. And so they're like, oh no, that's going to make you really unhealthy. And it's like, beans are an incredibly good source of protein. They are an incredibly healthy source of, of fiber, right? Like beans are very, very good for you. Peanuts are very, very good for you. So it's like, it's, 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 it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, whereas like, if you go on the paleo diet, all of a sudden you start eating really healthy. It's like, well, I got really good results on the paleo diet. And it's like, yeah, it makes sense that you got really good results. Overall, it's a decent diet, you know, but d nutrition is not magic. And a lot of people kind of take the approach that they think that it is. They think that it's a very, you know, it's like, it's almost like, you know, it's like, well, I'm supposed to drink this protein shake every day. I got to take my magic potion every day and it's going to have, you know, give me all the results. And it's like, the reality is, you know, uh, a generally healthy diet where, you know, you have birthday cake every now and then and ice cream on the weekends, you know, like a normal healthy diet where you do engage in like sweets and like treats for yourself, as long as they're not making up the bulk of your diet, um, 
and as long as you're being like regularly physically active has been shown to be enough to like reduce our risk of disease. The reason why like we feel like nutrition is is so messed up and bad in the world is because we just have a lot of access um, to really unhealthy foods, you know, like McDonald's is packed full of like trans and saturated fats, you know, um, because those are the things that are easy to cook quickly and they're the things that you generally taste the best. Um, and there's a great joke by Jim Gaffigan that I absolutely love where he's like, he's like, you're not better than McDonald's. <laughs> he's like, he's like, you know, you may not go to McDonald's, but that, you know, that Us magazine that you're reading, it's McDonald's. <laughs> and then he's like, he's like, talk to, he's like, he's like, McDonald's is delicious. He's like, your mom has never cooked anything that tastes as good as a McDonald's French fry. <laughs> like, and it's like, I get it. Like, I get what he means though. But the, the, the reason those fries are so good is because they're, you know, they're packed full of fats and salts and sugars, you know, like not exactly healthy for us. Um, they are practically nutritionally bankrupt. So is there room for that stuff in your life? Sure, absolutely, you know. But uh, the more that you you consume that kind of stuff, the more you're sort of placing chips down on a roulette table of, I want to have problems, you know. <laughs> like, um, and so you're increasing your risk. Um, doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to cause it, though. Um, so that's what an evidence-based practitioner is. We look at uh, general nutrition guidelines and, you know, what's been researched and, you know, uh, 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 helps us understand, like, um, you know, what is, uh, what's the, we, we are working for the best information that we have right now, but could there be better information coming down the line? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about nutrients today. Uh, we've talked about this before. There are going to be six essential nutrients uh, that your body needs for producing energy and keeping itself alive and continuing different body processes. Um, those six essential nutrients are going to be carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Those are your three macronutrients, vitamins and minerals. Those are your um, micronutrients. I said macro, didn't I? Uh, carbs, proteins, fats, those are macronutrients. I, heard, I hear micro in my, in my brain. Uh, vitamins, minerals, those are your micronutrients. And then water, uh, which is the most vital of nutrients, the most important thing uh, that allows you to basically even have a metabolism. Um, so macronutrients, uh, the reason we call them macro is because they are the nutrients that you need in very large quantities every single day, right? So like uh, you need a lot of them, uh, so we generally measure those in grams, which is kind of funny to say that we need a lot of them because a gram is very small. But you think about like the grams of carbohydrates, the grams of proteins found in food, uh, that's a lot more than like milligrams, which is what you're going to find your micronutrients. So usually milligrams or micrograms, um, those are your micronutrients, you know, uh, 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 you look at like iron, for instance, iron is one of our, uh, uh, trace minerals that we need. It's a mineral that we need very, very little of every day. But if we don't get enough of it, it starts to really cause problems. We don't have, you know, enough iron in our blood, which means we might become anemic, which means we won't be able to carry oxygen very efficiently. And if we can't carry oxygen efficiently, our body can't metabolize efficiently. We'll feel like we have really low energy and lethargic. But too much iron in your blood actually makes uh, it attract oxygen too much. Um, so what'll end up happening is your red blood cells gather oxygen really effectively, uh, but then they won't let it go. So then that will also suffocate your tissues. So too much iron in your diet can be very dangerous in its own way. Um, uh, uh, and so like, we want to make sure that we get enough of it, but we don't want to go like overboard. And that's kind of a lot of the, the conversation around nutrition sometimes. It's really about getting enough of something rather than, you know, getting the magic perfect amount. So when we're talking about carbohydrates, uh, what I mean is they are a compound. If we actually look at a molecule of glucose here, um, you'll see it is a compound of uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Yeah, freaking black background. God damn. Uh, <laughs> so there's, uh, well, I, I really want like this kind of classic example. There we go. That's, that's a clean image. Okay. Okay. So here's our kind of classic carbohydrate, right? You can see there's a lot of like C's in here. 
And so this right here is, is particularly like a molecule of glucose, right? Um, uh, so we can see like it's got hydrogen, it's got oxygen, and it's got carbon. Those are the ingredients that kind of make up a, a classic molecule of glucose. So what we actually do when we're metabolizing things is we're basically releasing the carbon um, from uh, uh, that material. We're releasing the hydrogen and the oxygen. And when we break this molecule of glucose down into you know, individual components, all we're end up left with is like a little bit of a carbon skeleton, which then we can just attach to an oxygen molecule and exhale. But like all that other stuff that we did to break it down is what releases the energy trap between all these bonds. That's all the metabolism stuff we were talking about is basically where we're releasing the energy from these bonds here. And that's what we're gonna use to create our, our ATP. Um, and then what we're left with is a little bit of carbon, right? And so our body attaches that carbon to an oxygen molecule. Now we have CO2 and we go, we exhale it. Uh, we're going to watch a very cool video uh, soon all about the science of weight loss. Um, it is a very detailed breakdown of the biochemistry of, of how we metabolize and, and burn energy and stuff. Um, and that's going to kind of show you where those are. Um, but it's really cool. He does, a, he does a really cool thing in the video where he blows up a balloon. Uh, so it's filled with, you know, all the air from his lungs, which means it's all of the um, carbon dioxide from metabolizing breakfast. And so he, he exhales that. And so that balloon has a lot of oxygen in it, but it does also have like a lot of um, CO2 in it. When he does, is if you drop the temperature of oxygen low enough, it'll actually turn into a liquid. It's kind of crazy. Uh, if you guys remember the video we watched uh, with the the news anchor and like he lit everything on fire, he used liquid oxygen to make it easier to light stuff on fire. Um, and liquid oxygen, if you just drop the temperature low enough, it'll do that. So this guy uses like liquid nitrogen to freeze the balloon and you'll watch the balloon shrink and basically get way smaller because all the oxygen molecules turn to liquid. So then there's a bunch of liquid in the bottom of this balloon and it's all deflated. But you'll also see these little like white droplets and those little white droplets are his breakfast. That's the carbon dioxide, uh, which freezes at a slightly different temperature. Um, and then eventually he kind of heats it back up and the balloon fills back up with air. It's really, it's really cool. Well, it's a really fun video for us to watch. Um, it's like a TED talk actually. Um, so, you know, but that's, that's what we mean when we say like we're metabolizing something, right? We talked about all this ATP production. We got all that ATP's energy from breaking down these bonds held within like glucose molecules in particular. So carbohydrates are our favorite source of energy, right? And, uh, you know, what I mean when I say a carbohydrate, a carbohydrate is like a, a large version of a whole bunch of these molecules assembled together. You know, if you actually look at a molecule, uh, if you look at a molecule of carbohydrates, it's, you know, it's going to be this big complex chain. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Polysaccharides. You know, it'll be this big, long, complex chain of all those glucose molecules attached together. Um, so that's where we're getting a pretty good chunk of our energy from. Uh, but we also have, uh, well, this is going in a very weird order. I'm going to skip to fats here real quick. <laughs> um, fats are also compounds uh, that actually have the same ingredients in them. So if we look at like a triglyceride, uh, which is going to be an individual lipid, an individual fat molecule. Uh, it's going to look something kind of like this, actually. Um, um, I'm afraid of this. Yeah, that background is not going to work. Uh, also, let's get one that goes down instead. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Okay, uh, I guess this won't work. I'm just trying to find one that I'm trying to find one that's facing downwards. So, because like this is already kind of like long and skinny. Uh, they're all the same. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, copy that and we'll paste it over here. So, there's our, our triglyceride, right? Actually, no, I can do it. Rotate. Bam. 
<laughs> so this is a triglyceride. This is a uh, this is an actual like lipid, right? So there's a lipid, uh, and we call it a triglyceride because this right here is what we refer to as the glycerol backbone, uh, which gives it a little bit of structure. And then this right here. Um, uh, is the actual like fatty acid portion of it. And there are three of them. So that's a tri three glycer for backbone uh, glyceride. So triglyceride. And that's usually how we draw them. You know, usually a lot of people will just kind of go like this and then they'll give them like three little tails that look like that. There's also diglycerides. That's also an example of a lipid uh, for the record, you know, which would be uh, two little tails. Uh, there's a monoglyceride, which is one little tail. And then there's just the fatty acid as well. You can have those all kind of separate. Uh, the fatty acid is actually what we, we really just want this section right here for the metabolism. Uh, like this is what we're metabolizing. If you look at the ingredients, right, it's hydrogen, just like we saw over here. It's oxygen, just like we saw over here. Uh, and then obviously it's definitely carbon which we saw over here. So the ingredients within fats are identical to the ingredients found within carbohydrates, which is why they are both used for energy. Because again, if we break this bond right here, uh, and we break, you know, or if we break this bond right here, a little bit of energy is gonna get released. Now, the amount of energy is very different. You're actually gonna see more energy inside of a lipid, which is why glucose molecules have four calories per gram, whereas lipids have seven calories. Oh, that's not true. Sorry, I'm thinking of alcohol. Sorry, nine <laughs> calories per gram. My apologies. Um, so glucose has four calories per gram, and lipids have nine calories per gram. Uh, alcohol, by the way, has seven. <laughs> um, uh, so the amount of energy found in here is actually, it's, it's an even richer source of energy. The problem is it's a very slow burning source of energy. Fats are oxidized in our slow metabolism, right? Our aerobic metabolism. And so like they kind of need to, um, you know, kind of get there. So they're good for like low sustained energy. That's a really good source for that. Uh, but it's not very good for like quick explosive athletic energy, which is why generally and professional athletes need to have like a pretty high carbohydrate diet um, so they can have that immediate energy source. Um, and then we've got our proteins. Now proteins, if we look at an amino acid, uh, and we're just gonna pull up one random amino acid here. We're, I don't need to, we don't need a million of, of them. There's 20 different variations of them, uh, but we're gonna pull up this one right here. And I'm going to make this whole thing just slightly smaller. This is going to get, <laughs> we're too zoomed in here. Um, oh, that got a little messy. That's okay. Uh, ooh, that is big. Make that much smaller. Um, so there's our, there's our, our amino acid here, right? Um, so amino so that's essentially our, our protein, right? Because um, that's all a protein is. It's a big complex chain of, of these 20 amino acids all kind of arranged together. So we're also going to see about four calories per uh, gram here as well, four calories uh, every single time. And again, we see there's carbon, there's hydrogen, and there's oxygen. The same ingredients that we found, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, right? Oxygen, hydrogen, Oop, that's oxygen again, carbon, right? So again, these chemical bonds right here are actually what hold all of our energy, right? Now, I will say the thing about protein is that you're going to see there's also other ingredients. You're going to see this N right here, right? That N, and I know it's, it kind of looks like a Z now because I turned it, uh, but that N, I should have laid these out vertically, um, is nitrogen. Now that nitrogen is what gives proteins their very unique shapes. You know, if you look at like uh, examples 
of, of proteins in the body. There's a lot of different examples, right? You can see there's contractile proteins, actin and myosin in your uh, in your muscles, for instance, hormones like insulin, uh, for instance, has like a molecule of protein that gives it its shape. Um, antibodies are proteins, uh, your hemoglobin in your blood, enzymes are proteins. Um, uh, that's spider silk. I don't know why that was the example they chose, but uh, the receptors in your body, your muscle spindles are made of, of, of proteins. So you know, there's a lot of different types of proteins out there and they all kind of look slightly different from one another because of the nitrogen. It gives them very unique shapes. My favorite thing, I always tell you guys, you know how I, I can't draw to save my life. I always love drawing proteins. When we draw a protein, check it out. There we go. There's a protein. Uh, that's usually how we, that's usually how we um, uh, uh, sh diagram proteins in the in the biology world because it's like yeah it's just a big you know funky looking chain um and so like generally when we're drawing proteins we just you know we kind of draw like a bunch of squiggles because it would be it kind of represents this you know it can be any shape you know um so that's what that's what that nitrogen is and then this r right here uh, that's actually, we call that an R group. That's also special. Um, think of the, the, there is no chemical R. Um, it's just that this is meant to represent, like imagine this, we zoom in on this box here uh, and we would see like another big complicated chain of, of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen um, and nitrogen. They would be shaped in 20 variations. So there are 20 different, we'll say colors of this letter R right here, representing the 20 different amino acids. So that's that's what the R group is. Um, so those are sort of our three, you know, that's that's like chemically what's going on there, right? So we say like proteins, we're talking about this big complex chain of all of these little amino acids. We talk about carbohydrates, we're talking about these big, big complex chains of sugar molecules. And we talk about fats, we're talking about these big complex chains of fatty acids all linked together. So they're each going to have their kind of own different versions, right? You're going to have like, uh, when it comes to amino acids, you're either going to have essential amino acids or non-essential ones, right? Non-essential amino acids, your body can synthesize if you don't get enough of them in your diet. Essential amino acids, not so much. You have to get those from your diet. Otherwise your body cannot assemble new proteins. It's going to miss, you know, 20, uh, some of the 20 ingredients. And if it's missing those ingredients and it's one of the ones that your body can't manufacture, then you're SOL, you know, the, you're out of luck and there's no way for you to, to get it. So uh, how do we get it? Well, we eat stuff, right? We eat uh, uh, products that have those amino acids in them. Um, so uh, uh, the next thing we gotta look at are vitamins and minerals. Um, vitamins and minerals, these are our micronutrients, right? These also, what's interesting about like vitamins, if you look at like, If you look at a vitamin's chemical structure, uh, it actually looks really, really, really similar to protein. Um, so here's a couple different uh, vitamins out there. You'll notice the ingredients are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, and nitrogen again. So the same uh, four ingredients that are found in protein. The difference is these are so freaking small uh, that they can't really be broken down. There's not enough energy for us to consider them having calories. A little bit, they do. They have calories. They have energy. The amount that they have is so small, though, that it's practically immeasurable. Um, so there is a little bit of like energy, but not for the most part. And then, so this is what our vitamins are, right? Uh, and they allow different physiologic processes to happen, right? So like they will have very cool properties um, because they are proteins and they bind to things and you know make very interesting shapes they do really cool stuff in our body right so like vitamin a for instance really helps with like the production of collagens and proteins uh vitamin e the same thing uh vitamin k helps with blood clotting it actually makes your body uh better at clotting your blood um uh of all of your b vitamins when we talk about the krebs cycle which we did um you know, and you see all of those crazy freaking enzymes, right? All of those enzymes, those are your B vitamins, right? So B vitamins are, you know, you'll hear people say, it's like, oh, it's got B vitamins in it. It's going to give me energy. B vitamins don't necessarily have any calories of their own. They don't have any energy of their own, but they do make you better at unlocking the energy that you would normally metabolize through the Krebs cycle. 
Uh, so that could be fats or carbohydrates. So do they give you energy? Not necessarily, but they make you better at utilizing the energy that you have already consumed. So we can say the B vitamins give you energy. <laughs> um, uh, minerals are also uh, very important. They are a micronutrient. You need very little of them each day, but minerals are inorganic. Uh, and what I mean by that, if you look at like, so if somebody has given me like the periodic table and they've just taken the minerals. Yeah, thank you, internet. Excellent job. So uh, <laughs> you take a look right here, you can actually see Oh, that's super small. Uh, we'll pick a different one. Um, take a look right here. You can see we've got hydrogen. We know that's a really big one. Oxygen, we know that's a really big one. There's carbon, right? Uh, and then there's nitrogen. So these four here um, on our periodic table, uh, these four here, here, and here are where we're getting most of our energy. But look at all these other minerals, right? Um, we got fluorine over here. Uh, we got uh, uh, sodium here, magnesium, calcium, potassium. Uh, valine uh, uh, is actually one of them. Uh, that's a super small. That actually doesn't, for the most part, count often. Uh, <laughs> zinc, that one interacts with our, you know. By the way, zinc is probably one of my favorite minerals. Zinc is how your immune system uh makes you know you guys know like you remember terminator 2 <laughs> um uh the t1000 right he did the like arm blade thing where is it? i want to see a picture of that uh yeah he does the like crazy like arm blade thing so your white blood cells uh actually do the same thing uh, what they do is if there's like a virus or something in your body, your white blood cells go and they like puncture the virus and they leave a little bit of zinc behind. And what that does is that actually triggers the other parts of your immune system that have like a bunch of enzymes that dissolve stuff, the, the actual like enforcers, they, the, you're, they're called your killer T cells. They come along afterwards and they like, they're like, oh, that person's been punctured with a little bit of zinc and then they eat it. <laughs> so like you, and they use a zinc to do that. And like, that's like one of my favorite, like weird facts about our immune system is like, you know, you basically have these little like T1000s that are going around and uh, uh, like puncturing little viruses keeping you healthy. So we want to have zinc. And that's why you find zinc in like cough drops and stuff is it's trying to help boost you with your cold in case you're low on zinc. Um, selenium is actually going to be one. Uh, I actually think this is selenium. I'm not sure what SN is. Um, iron over here. So a whole bunch of freaking minerals that are all, uh, uh, you know, going to be metabolized in our body. But so many of these are inorganic, right? Like iron and carbon don't get along super well. I mean, they do. You can get iron and carbon together. That's actually how we get uh, like carbon steel. Um, I, you know, zinc and carbon, not super well. So these are, we call these inorganic um, elements because they don't combine with carbon super well. Carbon is the backbone that gave our carbohydrates their shape. They're the backbone that gave uh, amino acids their shape for the most part. Well, it, most of their shape, I guess, comes from the nitrogen, um, but they have a lot of carbon in them, giving them more shape. Um, fats, they, they're built on the, you know, backbone of carbon. So those are, that's why carbon is considered an organic. When you hear like sci-fi movies and they say like, oh, they're carbon-based life forms. What they mean is they eat proteins, fats, and carbs. <laughs> that's, what that's, that's what that sentence means when you hear that in a sci-fi movie. Um, so minerals, right, are, are ones that we don't necessarily use, right? These are, these are things that make up our body and they help us with certain physiologic processes, um, but they're not something that we metabolize for energy. We can't break minerals down to release energy because there's no energy trapped within the bonds of their chemicals, if that makes sense. Um, so, you know, calcium, for instance, gives us bone structure, uh, but we don't break calcium down for energy. 
And then, like I said, we got water. Water is the most essential nutrient because everything I've been talking about today, when we talk about this idea of, of breaking up molecules, you know, if you look at like a disaccharide, for instance, um, my student loans but nobody wants to do that uh <laughs> you look at a molecule of like sucrose here right this is a a double sugar molecule right um so it's a disaccharide if i take a little bit of hydrogen and a little bit more hydrogen and a little bit of oxygen and i shove it between these molecules here right and i put it like this and I've got like a little HO pair over here and a little uh, HO pair over here. Now I can have two happy separate little molecules, right? I can just go ahead and, you know, take this right from over here and break that off. And then I can break this one off over here, you know, and then uh, all I have is all I'm left with is something that kind of kind of looks like this, right? HO at the end of that. And that's a nice happy molecule now. And then there's an OH pair. Uh, over here, making that and that well, <laughs> you believe that uh, that's a nice happy molecule uh, uh, over here as well. So now I've got two separate molecules, and now I can break that down and metabolize it for energy. I can take that to my mitochondria, and my mitochondria can break all these cell walls and release all the energy and the calories and allow me to 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 work. And so I needed oxygen, I needed water, uh, hydrogen, and oxygen to be able to break those molecules up. Um, so water is literally the most essential nutrient you've got. I mean, you can live, I guess the arguably the most essential nutrient would be oxygen because that's also where we get a lot of our energy from. Um, you know, you can go a few minutes without oxygen. You can go maybe a day or two without water, um, but you can go quite a while without food because you have a lot of it stored in your body. So water is certainly the most essential nutrient. I, you know, you can go quite some time without protein in your diet. You can go quite some time without, you know, carbohydrates in your diet, um, comparatively. <laughs> so those are our basic nutrients. Now, when we're talking about nutrients in terms of calories, most of the time we're going to be talking about our energy nutrients. We are going to be talking about carbs, proteins, and fats. That is what we mean when we say like calories, right? Calories are the amount of energy trapped within a food. And so we are releasing the energy from carbs, proteins, and fats. Are you releasing energy from vitamins? Uh, theoretically, maybe. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, essentially we are, right? Um, but not in a level that like is very measurable by us. You know what I mean? So uh, we're doing all of this because that's going to allow us to produce ATP, right? Adenosine triphosphate, which we've talked to or talked about to death at this point. Uh, our body's a you know main source of energy for work, right? Um, so adenosine triphosphate. If you look at a molecule of ATP, by the way, if you look at like a molecule of adenosine, um, you know it's it's actually like uh, uh, it's this protein called adenine, which your body can assemble and make. So it's going to get that from its protein uh, and a sugar called ribose, um, which is a very. So there's the adenine right there and there's the sugar right there. So this is adenine and ribose. And that's where you get adenosine. Um, so your body is taking carbohydrates and breaking the chemicals down and releasing the energy from those chemical structures to reshape it into the ribose uh, uh, and it's getting a little bit of nitrogen It's breaking that down into the, into the uh, adenine. Uh, and then all we do is just attach three little phosphates to it, which means by the way, we also need to have phosphorus in our diet, um, which you are also going to find in fats, which is always a little bit confusing, um, but there is also a little bit of like phosphorus found uh, inside of our fats. And so our body is gonna attach those little phosphates and then it can, break those phosphates off and that's how we get all of our energy. Um, so proteins, fats, and carbs, really good sources of ATP. And that's our, those are our six essential nutrients in, in a nutshell there. Uh, any questions so far, guys? How are we all feeling? I have not said hi, by the way, to Marvin or Eric. Welcome, guys. I'm glad to have you here. <laughs> um, Questions or anything, guys? Are we feeling good about that? Okay, I have a quick question. Um, so, like, I remember you were saying uh, if somebody asked us, uh, I think it's for like a meal kind of diet or meal something, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
how will we go about it if we go with like uh instead of meals like shakes or something or different kind of stuff like uh instead of food you get me like yeah so is more, there... li more liquid kind of stuff like protein and and all that stuff and because my buddy actually hit me up and was asking me um if i was still taking creatine uh -huh. and i told him i haven't taken it in a long time but i'm getting back into my workout scene again and right when i said that oh bro let's let's link up let's let's work out again and start doing it again <laughs> you know and he's like because i i made a shake and i called it the um the double x praying mantis because there's a praying mantis shake at okay. the ufc gym yeah and then i made my own so it was two scoops That's creatine funny. one scoop protein and then two bananas um like maybe a half of jar of uh, peanut butter and wow. then um what else did i put in it? i put something else in it. I, I i can't remember what it was but it's gonna have something green in there if it's called a praying mantis right there's gonna be like spinach or something right <laughs> yeah so there there was a little bit of spinach not too much but a little bit of it because they used it over there too at the gym i seen them use it so i try to rep not replicate it too much but like throw my own little twist to it <laughs> and i called it the, the double legs praying mantis <laughs> that's fun uh well here's the thing so so is there sort of an advantage to um like a liquid diet right like protein shakes versus uh, uh, sort of traditional food, right? Like, for instance, like, should you eat a 26 gram uh, chicken breast, you know, uh, that's got 26 grams of protein in it after a workout, or should you just take whey protein and, and drink 26 grams, which, which would be considered superior? Um, both, you're going to get the nutrients into the body either way. But the shake is already somewhat broken down. It's there's a lot of water within it, right? Um, so there's a lot of like hydrolysis, right? There wasn't a lot of water when it was like a protein powder, and then phew, it hit water and phew, got all mixed up, and that broke it down even further. So now, because you know, again, we need lots of water in our diet, we need lots of you know this other stuff in our diet. When that goes in there, yeah, there's going to be a, a substantial uh, uh, sort of amount there, right? There's going to be plenty of um protein like available and calories available um but you would have gotten the same thing from the chicken breast your body just needs longer to break it down so the reason like whey protein has been considered um an effective supplement over the years is because of how absorbable it is it is just something that can kind of pass straight into your bloodstream really really quickly which is like very handy if you just got done working out and you're trying to like you don't want to waste any time in getting recovery happening right like your workout's over you're leaving the gym start drinking that protein shake right now if you do your recovery process is starting the minute you're leaving the gym you know um so they have found that to be very effective but in terms of like general nutrition it's not like it's going to be um uh, more protein compared to say something else um it doesn't necessarily mean that it is guaranteed to be healthier now that being said if there's also like something that you want, like my girlfriend doesn't love vegetables. <laughs> she, she would be the first to tell you this. Uh, and it's funny, like this is something we actually see eye to eye. I, I don't like leafy vegetables. I really don't like leafy greens. I can deal with spinach, but all the other ones are, I cannot do lettuce to say, I would never, you'll never see me eat lettuce. <laughs> it's not going to happen ever. <laughs> uh, I don't like arugula, you know any of that stuff. Uh, I like spinach enough. Spinach is, is fine. Uh, and I can get, I can get away with kale every now and then, but, um, but like, it's funny, like that's such a good source of vitamins and minerals. So what my girlfriend does is she blends up like a lot of kale into a smoothie with a lot of like berries and, you know, kind of like what you're talking about. Um, she makes a shake every morning and that's her favorite breakfast. And what's great about that is it's all broken down into this like very, you know, great tasting smoothie that she likes. Um, and it's packed full of nutrients, you know, but could she just have eaten, you know, a salad and a cup of blueberries and a, and a, and a little bit of peanut butter and gotten the same things? Yeah. I mean, she didn't change any of the chemistry within that. She just broke it down and then made it very easy to enter the bloodstream very easily. And she found a very advantageous way to consume it. So when people ask me about like taking like, uh, like there's this company, have you guys heard of Huel? Um, they're like, uh, they, they, they call themselves a complete 
food. And it's a protein shake. It's a protein powder. Originally, it's a protein powder. Now they've got other stuff um, uh, that uh, has your entire day's worth of, of nutrients in it. So if we look at like um, the about section, let's see if I can find. Uh, let me just find the protein. Huel Black Edition. I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah, but you look here and it's like you kind of it kind of breaks down like you know shows you this is just a visualization of what it will look like but it's got tapioca and coconut and peas and stuff and so like it's gonna have all 27 vitamins and minerals and a whole bunch of protein you know it's pretty good right that's that's very healthy uh do i think you need to do this not necessarily if you've got a, a healthy diet and you can get it all from food great me personally i know that i can't get all of my nutrients from food. I, you know, um, sometimes like I, you know, I'm going to have days of where my nutrition is not super well dialed in. So on days like that, or if I know I'm doing something like that, that is where, yeah, if I don't know, if I know I'm not getting enough protein, I'm going to stop buying get a protein shake. Protein shakes are very quick, easy, convenient, you know, especially if you're trying to go on like a weight gain diet, if you're trying to like gain muscle mass, you need an excess of calories. So shakes are a super handy tool because it can just be a ma massive download of calories without making you feel super full later down the line. Does that answer your question, Carlos? I know that I, I, yeah, it's, it's kind of. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was perfect. That was really perfect. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's, I mean, the answer is always, this is what's so frustrating. My answer to every question that will be asked in nutrition is it depends, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but, but I mean, like, that's kind of, that's the reason why it depends, you know? <laughs> no, but that was perfect. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. So let's talk about like, when I say we need enough vitamins and minerals, what do I mean by that? What, no, how much, how much vitamins, how much, how many minerals, right? Um, well, those numbers are determined by what are called our DRIs. These are known as your dietary reference intakes. Um, now, the original version, you guys might remember, if you actually look at a nutrition facts label, um, uh, ooh. <laughs> uh, if, if you look at uh, a nutrition facts panel, a lot of times you'll see uh, it says like, this is 5% uh, of the saturated fat you should have in a day. This is 13% of this. This is, you know, 45% uh, of the iron you need in a day, right? So that's sort of the panel. What do I mean? What do you mean 45%? Well, this is based on a 2000 calorie diet. So if you were, you know, if you go to a BMR or a TDEE calculator, you know, uh, you punch in your numbers, right? Uh, and, you know, the amount of calories you're supposed to eat is, is 2,000 calories, right? Well, then this is exactly the, uh, the amount of like iron and potassium or well, 45% of the iron you need in a day. So that is uh, what we refer to as an RDA. That's the recommended dietary allowance, the average intake that's sufficient to meet the needs of about 90, so I believe it's 97.5% of people. So it's, it's most of the population by a substantial margin, right? But we found that RDAs didn't always translate directly. They weren't always perfect. Um, and so uh, we needed to... Uh, um, they weren't necessarily uh, 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 perfect for us. Um, so we needed to get a little bit more specific. So instead they retooled things a few years ago and came up with the DRI method. So the DRI method or the dietary reference intake still has the RDA. And this is usually the number that we're referring to when we talk about getting enough iron or enough potassium in a day. But they've also got these other versions as well for special <coughs> nutritional situations. So for instance, uh, we're gonna see the EAR that's the estimated average requirement. And this is the daily needs of a vitamin or mineral to meet the needs of at least half of the population of a specific age group. So you'll see that like the RDA, uh, if we look at the RDA of iron, uh, it's eight milligrams a day uh, for men and women, okay? Uh, but for premenopausal women, 
uh, they're going to need a little bit more. They're going to need about 18 milligrams a day, which is a substantial difference, right? And that's because like due to like menstruation, right? There's going to be a substantial loss of like iron consistently, you know, on a monthly basis, right? So we replace that iron through like our diet. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we're referring to. So the RDA is just a standard eight milligrams that meets the needs of most people, right? Uh, but the EAR for like premenopausal women is a different number, right? Uh, there's also the adequate intake level, the AI. Adequate intake is basically the bare minimum. You can think of it as it's like, it's like, it's enough to, before we start. To, it's like, there's enough that you won't have problems, but it's certainly not optimal, right? Uh, this is the recommendation when we can't figure out uh, the right numbers for an EAR or the RDA. It's like, we know that we need this much to keep us healthy. We don't know what the perfect amount actually is. Um, there are certain nutrients that, you know, sort of operate like that in the body where we're like, <clears throat> we know we need this. We don't exactly know exactly how much of it. Like nucleotides are kind of a good, good example. For the record, there is a seventh nutrient that we never talk about that are the nucleotides that the DNA held within like the food that we eat, uh, the animals, the, the plants, all of it has DNA. Um, <clears throat> I, I have no idea how to break down how much nucleotides you need. <laughs> uh, nobody does, you know, <laughs> like, um, so it's like, yeah, we know we need that, you know, but, but you're going to get it from food naturally anyway. So this is the minimum amount needed by a population, right? The bare minimum. Uh, and then there's the, the tolerable upper intake level or the UL. This is kind of an interesting one. This is the highest amount of a nutrient that you can have per day before it starts to cause um, adverse effects. So we'll see this uh, when we talk about minerals, but too much of certain minerals. You know what happens if you eat too much vitamin A? It's not a mineral, uh, but you know, it's a vitamin. But what happens when you eat too much vitamin A? Uh, it turns your skin orange. <laughs> um, people who eat like a ton of carrots and a ton of sweet potatoes and things like that, uh, you'll actually get so much retinol that your body will basically try to store it uh, inside your skin. You know what happens if you get too much lycopene? That's the, the, uh, uh, pro, that's the, the, um, nutrient found in like tomatoes and stuff. Uh, oh, I can't find a picture of it. Uh, it'll turn your skin red. You'll look a little bit rosy. Uh, if you get too much, um, uh, uh, cyanins, yeah, I'm not gonna find a picture of that. Uh, but if you get too much like blue foods, it can actually even you know turn you blue. So it's kind of interesting. It can change the color of your skin uh, uh, naturally if you get too much of these like vitamins or minerals in your diet. Um, and it causes like other problems as well. Like actually too much uh, of certain vitamins can interrupt how your body utilizes certain minerals um, because those things are those minerals and those vitamins are very attracted to one another. So like, um, let's say you break a bone, right? Your doctor will actually give you the recommendation to reduce your sodium intake and increase your calcium intake, which is kind of weird. And it's like, well, what do you mean? I have a bro, you know, what does sodium have to do with my, my, my bones aren't made of sodium. It's like, no, they're not. But sodium and calcium actually are kind of buddy, buddy. Uh, they kind of get along really well. And so they like to combine together. And if you have sodium and calcium attached together, unfortunately, <laughs> it can't become bone tissue anymore because now these are like, you know, it can't bring sodium along. So what ends up happening is like the sodium starts decreasing your bone density. And if you have a broken bone, you're trying to grow your bone density. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. So that's where the tolerable upper intake levels are, right? It's where like, well, if you have too much of this in your diet, it can, it can really start to cause problems. So, uh, but most of what we're talking about and, and you know, is, is getting enough vitamins. I mean, we, here's the thing, guys. It is totally possible to overdose on too many vitamins in your diet. Um, like I said, you, you can turn your skin a different color. You can, you know, change all kinds of things. It is absolutely possible to have too many minerals in your diet, too much vitamins in your diet. I've never really seen it <laughs> that much in my career, though. You know, um, not really. <laughs> because, like, how many people do you know eat too healthy? You know, I, I've had a few people eat too much vitamin A before. I had a client, I had a, I had a, not a client, actually, I had a friend who was also a trainer. 
And she loved sweet potatoes. She would just always go on and on about it. Because here's the thing, like sweet potatoes are a really good source of, of vitamin A and they are packed full of vitamins. Um, uh, and so she just loved it. And her palms were bright orange. Um, and it's, you know, and I was like, man, you might, uh, you might dial back, you know, you might, you might lay, lay out the, lay out the sweet potato, you know, maybe switch to a russet potato for a while, you know, um, or a golden potato or something else. Uh, <clears throat> so generally we, we can see too much of it. However, what we'll generally see are people who do not get enough vitamins and minerals, right. Or enough protein. Right. So what we often will see are foods that have been enriched or fortified uh, with vitamins. Um, so uh, uh, what we're talking about with enrichment and fortification, right? Enrichment is the addition of vitamins uh, to a refined product. OK, um, so let's say. Let's look at a, a double fiber bread, for instance. So double fiber bread, you can buy this at the store, right? This is an example of a food that has been enriched with fiber. There is naturally going to be fiber in bread, right? We're naturally going to find fiber. You know, it's going to have certain parts of the, the carbohydrates that are, you know, cellulose that can't be broken down, right? Because wheat grain has cellulose around it. And so some of it's not gonna be right. You look at, uh, uh, look at the nutrition facts panel of a of double fiber bread here. Is that actually it? Hold on. There we go. I was like, that's not the right. Actually, yeah, here we go. We got uh, our double fiber bread here. And here's regular bread uh, right here. So you look at like a, a double fiber slice of bread and sure enough, it's got six grams of fiber per bread slice. And over here, we look at this one, it's only got four grams of fiber bread slice per bread slice, right? Uh, and if it was Wonder Bread, uh, which is, you know, what I grew up eating, uh, <laughs> uh, everybody's favorite, dietary fiber less than a gram you know, um, but it does have a lot of sugar in it, which makes it taste really good. <laughs> um, so you'll notice that like, it doesn't have a lot of vitamins and it, it is missing a certain vitamin or mineral. So what it'll do is we'll enrich that vitamin. We'll boost the levels of that food in there. And the idea is that like that vitamin or mineral is naturally found in that food. So when we consume it, our body will naturally want to absorb that vitamin or mineral uh, much more easily. Because here's the thing, why don't we just eat McDonald's every day and then take a multivitamin, right? Why don't we just do that? Um, and it's because like, well, number one, that there's adverse effects of too much stuff, the tolerable upper intake level of saturated fat you're going to hit that cap really quickly eating at McDonald's every day. Um, but the other reason is our body just doesn't absorb vitamins that well in pill form. They tried this. They, they tried to do this in like World War II, you know, like you'd be out there, you'd be a soldier in the middle of, of, of you know, nothingness. And so they would like, you know, like, you know take your vitamins. And that's, that's actually how in vitamins were originally invented, actually. Um, they're like, why don't we just put it into a thing that has like super high levels? And they gave it to people and, you know, they've seen some absorption of vitamins, vitamins, can, these vitamin supplements can help sometimes, but there's just something about it. Like the levels are so freaking high at the time uh, that your body just doesn't absorb it very well, uh, which you think about it is it's like, well, you got water soluble vitamins, you get fat soluble vitamins, right? And so you need to bring those things into the body by getting plenty of water and plenty of fat. Most people take their vitamin supplements with maybe a glass of water, but there's so much, like there's so much of that vitamin in that water that there's not enough water to carry all of it. So some of it just, you know, kind of passes through you and doesn't really get used. That's what happens with the uh, uh, we call it riboflavin. You know, when you take a multivitamin and you, you go to the bathroom and your pee looks like the Incredible Hulk, it looks like, you know, almost fluorescent yellow or it almost looks green. <laughs> like, um, yeah, that's, that's the extra like vitamin B5 coming out. 
because your body's like, yeah, I, I can't absorb this much all at once, you know? Um, so vitamins, not necessarily the same. So what we found is like, well, what if we can add it to a food that might help a little bit? And so that's where enriched foods come from. Uh, you'll often see that like uh, cereals and things like that have been enriched. Um, fortification, really similar uh, to enrichment, except that fortification is if there is a vitamin or mineral that you were to add to a food that doesn't naturally have it. So for instance, uh, you're not going to find, um, uh, I don't think you're gonna find vitamin C uh, in pasta, right? It has eggs in it, so I guess it would have some vitamin C, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, actually, I guess it would. Uh, what's something you don't find in pasta? <laughs> um, magnesium. Yeah, there's gonna be a really low level of magnesium. So if you were to add magnesium to pasta, that is an example of what we call fortification. You're fortifying that pasta. Um, so there is a difference between those two. Enrichment is the addition of vitamins or minerals uh, to a food that already contains those vitamins and minerals, you are simply boosting the levels, right? Uh, and then fortification uh, is where you are adding vitamins and minerals to a food that might not necessarily have had it naturally. Uh, I don't know what Huel is made out of. Let's take a look at that Huel powder. Oh Lord. <laughs> Ah, there we go. Is Huel vegan? I think it might be. Uh, pea protein, uh, cocoa powder. So it's got cocoa butter, erythritol, uh, cocoa fiber, 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 brown rice protein, chicory protein, glycerin, peanut butter, water. Yeah, it's pretty good. That's, this is great. Um, all these are totally, totally natural ingredients. So I would say this food is only going to be enriched, if anything. Um, it would not be fortified. Um, yeah, and it's completely, is, is Huel vegan? Oh, it is. It is totally plant-based. Interesting. I didn't know that. So here's the thing. Is that better? Uh, maybe, you know, it's, if it's, if you're absorbing all those vitamins and minerals, if you have a diet that is very, you know, uh, not rich in vitamins and minerals, then maybe, you know, that's a really good option for you. Uh, do you need to be vegan? Not necessarily. You know, the reason why whey protein is so um, popular is number one, whey is a byproduct of making cheese. So we have a lot of whey in the world. <laughs> um, it's very easy for us to make whey. <laughs> uh, but number two, it is just basically protein that is just a big soup of amino acids. So it can just go straight into your bloodstream and it will always be a complete protein. So the reason why Huel is using pea protein and rice protein is because peas are gonna miss some of your essential amino acids. Rice is going to miss some of your essential amino acids. Now, when you put them together, you've got a complete protein. Is it the same as like an animal-based source? Theoretically, you know? Um, so, you know, it, it is a, it is a really good option. I don't necessarily hate that Huel stuff. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I actually was talking about Huel yesterday it's because like, uh, it's really good for like, you know, people who just can't get their nutrition in, you know, I think it can be a good way to hedge your bets. Um, you want to take a multivitamin? I think it's a good way to hedge your bets. Do I support any specific multivitamin? No, I get like literally, uh, the multivitamin that I get that I never ever remember to take uh, is Trader Joe's, you know, um, Trader Joe's men's multivitamin. Uh, you know, are there better ones out there? Probably, you know, uh, are the liquid vitamins better because they can be absorbed easier? Maybe, you know, um, but at the same time, like it's meant to be a supplement, you know, it's meant to be supplemental to an already healthy diet. It's not meant to replace anything. That is not how I use vitamins. And that's not how I recommend my clients use vitamins. I don't think you should replace food with supplements, you know? Uh, okay, so 
Uh, any questions on RDAs, DARs, enrichment, fortification, anything like that? Marvin, I saw you unmute for just a second. Do you have any questions? I just bumped it. Everybody feeling good? Okay. Uh, all right. Well, let's go ahead and look at, uh, let's, you know, it's funny. We're actually at the end of our notes here. Um, but there's a lot of slides left. It's just going to go over some 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 basic guidance stuff. So let's talk about like how we're going to let's let's sort of look at some of the general advice that we're going to be giving over the next couple of weeks, right? Um, so dietary guidelines are meant to be like recommendations for how to implement like healthy food into a, a diet and exercise program, right? So generally, we want to instruct our clients to. I mean, like these are generally good piece of advice for people living in the US, right? Gen want to find a way to balance our calories, right? We know one of the things we're going to talk about is energy in versus energy out. We know that we need to balance out our calories to make sure that we are not getting like an excess of calories, which will result in an excess of storage in the body and increased body fat. Uh, we know that we don't want to have too few calories because that means that we're going to reduce the body. We want to find balance unless our, our goal happens to be to gain or lose weight. Um, and then we also want to generally reduce the amount of sodium we, in we intake. Now, sodium is a super essential nutrient. It's one of your electrolytes, right? Uh, your body cannot create electric impulses without sodium. But we live in the US and we have a lot of sodium in our foods. <laughs> we have a lot of canned foods, we have a lot of processed foods. And sodium uh, uh, is antibacterial, so it, it keeps like stuff from molding, it keeps stuff from you know, breaking down over time. Um, so we add sodium and it preserves our food, which is great. But unfortunately, it starts to cause problems when it you know, gets into our body, it can harden our arteries, it can reduce your you know, calcium absorption, all kinds of problems. Saturated fatty acids, we generally want to reduce that. Saturated fat has been shown to increase cholesterol uh, and solid fats and, and clog our arteries. We want to avoid added sugars. They are empty calories that give you plenty of energy, uh, but unfortunately it gives you so much energy so quickly that your body will then you know, crash afterwards, uh, which often sends you into fat storage mode, which is not great. And we want to reduce our refined grains and alcohol. Now, can you have everything on this list as part of your diet? Absolutely. It's just recommended that we don't go overboard, right? Too much of that stuff is really what starts to cause our problems. Um, what about uh, uh, things that we should eat, right? What about stuff that we should increase? Well, we're going to generally recommend that we increase our fruit and vegetable intake as well as our intake of whole grains rather than processed grains. Guys, from now on, if you're going to the pasta, get whole wheat, uh, 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 get whole wheat pasta, you know? Um, just the stuff that's a little darker looking, it's going to have more fiber in it, you know? It's going to have more iron. It's going to have more nutrients. I'll, you know, I'm not saying that this stuff is bad, the regular yellow pasta. I'm just saying that it is very processed, which is great because it'll last longer on a shelf. So that's very good for the economy, uh, but unfortunately isn't going to be as healthy for us as something that has like a good source of fiber in it. Um, so as we're looking for there. Uh, generally, the U.S. is going to recommend that you switch to fat-free or low-fat milk products because fat is very high in saturated fat as well. Um, I'm sorry, I said fat is high in saturated fat. Milk is high in saturated fat as well. Um, so generally, we recommend like fat-free versions of those things. Um, that being said, saturated fat can be fine. So, you know, uh, get the version of, of milk that is your favorite. Uh, but watch your saturated fat intake uh, overall. Uh, and then try to increase your protein, um, try to increase like your healthy, when it says oils, they mean healthy oil, liquid fats, liquid fats are associated with the good cholesterols, right? Uh, uh, so how can we do all this? What's a good system? This is something we'll talk more about, uh, throughout the entire course. Um, this is going to be a central theme, you know, starting today. Uh, one of the best ways we can give nutritional advice is talking about the my plate food guidance system. Do you guys remember the original like food pyramid? Right? The idea here is that it's like, look, this is the original, this is the one I used to see all the time in the 90s. 
uh, with like the black, it always looked like stars in the background. <laughs> um, but like the idea is that like the majority of your diet should come from like whole grain sources, right? But they would just say like bread, cereals, rice, and pastas. They never said whole grains, but that's totally what they should have been saying. Uh, vegetables and fruits should make up a pretty good portion of your diet as well. Uh, milk and egg products uh, get its own little category here. And then meat products. I don't know why this is all not just one big group. It totally should be. And then like your fats, oils, cupcakes, sweets, and things like that uh, at the very top. That should be, you know, um, uh, uh, used sparingly, right? The lots of like sugar and stuff. Uh, and then here's sort of like a, a re, you can see people have retooled this concept. Um, I actually think this is not bad. I, I don't know, it's a little bit, it's fine. Uh, but that's sort of the original food pyramid. And it worked decently, but it just wasn't a very clear way. People weren't able to really translate that very well to actual diets. So what we came up with instead uh, is called the My Plate the my plate guidance system, right? It looks something kind of like this. And it's like, the idea behind this is if you can make every one of your plates every day look something kind of like this, um, you're probably gonna be consuming a pretty darn healthy diet, right? So half of your plate every single time should be comprised of like fruits and vegetables. Now I will say me personally, the way I eat, I find it very weird. This would be a very weird meal to me. now rice and chicken and broccoli, yes. Adding strawberries to that meal, a little weird to me. I would probably just do a half a plate of broccoli instead. But then for breakfast, maybe I do something like some chicken uh, sausage and then like a slice of like whole grain toast and, you know, a full half a plate of strawberries. In fact, actually, that's exactly what I'm going to be having for breakfast once this call is over. Uh, <laughs> that is this week's example breakfasts. Uh, <laughs> um, that's, that's what I'm going to do there, you know? So it's like, I'm averaging out half of a, you know, a quarter strawberries and a quarter of like broccoli. Um, but to me, like that meal makes a lot more sense. You'll see versions like this is a really good example of like a healthy meal, right? Uh, you, the whole bento box approach. Um, you can see this version here. Right. So we get a grain, fruits, veggies, and a protein. We break it down kind of like that. Now, I will say this says dairy right here. Uh, we're in the US and our entire freaking economy is built on dairy cows and milk. Uh, you do not have to get dairy at every meal. Um, the idea here is that this would be like fat free milk every freaking time. Yeah, maybe, you know, like, uh, according to the US, that's like the best idea. Now, there is something that I prefer uh, that we're going to see in a later class called the Harvard eating plate. Uh, I like this much better, puts a little bit more emphasis on, um, puts a little bit more emphasis on vegetables and a little bit less emphasis on fruits, just because fruits are a little bit higher in sugar. Fiber uh, is going to be found a little bit more in vegetables. Whole grains and proteins stay exactly the same. <clears throat> and then instead of having like a glass of milk, it's like get some water and add about a tablespoon of healthy oil at every meal. Um, so olive oil, can, uh, uh, even canola oil actually is somewhat healthy. Uh, but olive oil is a really good example. Avocado oil is fantastic. Um, uh, things like that, uh, rather than just a thing of milk. <laughs> um, here's the thing, that milk is a really good source of fat. Um, it just shouldn't be your only source. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different like my plate examples out there. Um, so I find there was a really good picture here. That's a really cool look at my plate. You can see broccoli, carrots. Uh, that's strawberries and blueberries, and I don't know what that is, probably squash or something, right? Apples, all those would be things that can make up half your plate versus like these lean proteins over here, you know, eggs and beans and uh, salmon, yogurt, uh, cheese, beef. Um, and over here, like different whole grain pastas. Look at how dark these pastas are. So here's my favorite piece of advice. 
to give nutritionally. And honestly, if you forget everything that I tell you in this entire nutrition course, but you give people this piece of advice, you'll be a pretty darn good nutritionist right out the gate. Try to make every meal <clears throat> as colorful as possible. If you can do that, you're going to have a leg up right out the gate. You know, um, if we just look up colorful meal examples, you will notice that the foods that have the most color are often the healthiest foods you can eat. Um, that's kind of cool. This is an interesting approach to meal prep. They got like frozen, I guess this is like a, a smoothie that they would make, right? And then there's like a snack. I don't know what's in there. I don't know what that is. Where, where am I? What, what, what is this? <laughs> the 21 day fix, I don't know. Yeah, so you got salads. It'd be what? That's eggs. So it's a what, cob salad. There we go. Uh, and then fruits, proteins. Oh, there it's oatmeal. <laughs> uh, I see. I see. So I'm I'm sorry. So this is oatmeal in the morning with berries in it, a salad, and then a smoothie later. That's like a, a shakeology thing. So I don't know. I I definitely don't think you need to do that. But honestly, is it getting enough nutrients? Yeah, sure. They don't have to eat that way, but it is a good example, right? Look at how colorful some of these meals are, right? Um, so that's a really good way to ensure- that I'm you're... hungry, I'm hungry now. <laughs> I know, it happens every time, man, like in nutrition, I'm always like, yeah, the next eight days are gonna be, <laughs> I'm always hungry after this class. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you are gonna need to learn how to read food labels. Um, and so like, that's where under breaking down how the FDA sort of like labels things. So when you look at a nutrition food label, it's going to look something kind of like this. You're going to see like, this is a slice of bread, for instance, uh, it'll have the calories. Now, first thing you should always look at when you're looking at a food label, you should always pay attention to the serving size, right? Uh, deceiving. A lot of times you will notice when you read like a nutrition facts panel uh, is it'll say like, hey, it's only actually, you know, a good example. Le you know, those Lenny and Larry cookies. I freaking love these things. Um, uh, at least these big ones. I like the big ones. I like this one in particular, the white chocolate macadamia nut. That's my favorite cookie. <laughs> um, but it's kind of interesting because if you look at it, the serving size is one half cookie. Who eats a half a cookie? I don't know anybody. <laughs> you know, like, um, so a full cookie is what we're talking about here, right? That is, is what we mean. But we, we want to see this many, you know, there is a, you know, when you eat a full cookie, you're actually, you're not getting 210 calories, you're getting 420. You're not getting six grams of fat, you're getting 12 grams of fat. Um, so that's one thing we got to like pay attention to right off the gate. Always look at the serving size first. Then we can pay attention to the calories. That's the amount of energy found within that food. Uh, the amount of fat uh, that's going to be found in there, the grams of protein, uh, the grams of carbohydrates, the grams of fiber. Uh, you're going to see uh, generally vitamins A, C, calcium, and iron. Obviously, there are way more nutrients out there, and all of those are also very important. But that is the general nutrition facts panel. So serving size, uh, calories, total fat, saturated fat, and trans fat. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll see the more advanced breakdown. Um, uh, where you'll see they'll do all four types of fat. Uh, good Lord. Can I find one? Oh my God, so annoying. You know, let's look up an olive oil. There we go. Sometimes you'll see fats uh, and it'll have all four of the types listed. Um, but it's, as you can tell, pretty rare. Um, cholesterol, sodium, 
So all of the things that we're going to see on our nutrition facts panel, and then you're going to see it presented as a percent daily value. So basically, if we know uh, the RDA, let's see here. Um, the RDA for sodium uh, is going to be 2300 milligrams per day. So let's go back to that panel that we saw a minute ago. There are 160 milligrams uh, in this slice of bread. So 160 divided by 2300, that gives us 0.69%, which if you look right here, this, this is 7% of your sodium per day. And that's where they got that number from. If you're consuming a 2000 calorie diet, that's the recommendation. Now, if you're consuming a higher than that diet, what if you're consuming 3000 calories a day? Maybe that number is a little bit different, you know? Um, those numbers are gonna shift for sure. But those are the general recommendations. This is based on a 2,000 calorie diet. You can see here, uh, uh, it's 24 milli 2,400 milligrams per day if you're on a 2,500 calorie diet. So those numbers are going to shift ever so slightly, depending on the individual. So these are our recommended amounts. On a 2,000 calorie diet, we recommend you get about 65 grams of fat per day, but less than 10% of your calories should come from saturated fat. So we go with 20 grams saturated per day. The rest of that remaining 45 grams should be unsaturated oils. So olive oil and things like that. Protein, we recommend about 50 grams per day on a 2,000 calorie diet. Now you guys might remember I gave you protein recommendations. It was a lot higher than that. You know, we said like one gram per pound would actually be a good amount or 0.8 grams per pound more accurately. Um, yeah, that actually, you know, that's going to be different because again, it's a special circumstance. This is why nutrition can be so complicated. But in general, if you're a sedentary person on a 2,000 calorie diet, 50 grams is about all you need. 300 milligrams of cholesterol, 300 grams of carbohydrates, 25 grams of fiber per day. Guys, we need a little bit more than that. Um, it's recommended that we get close to 40 grams of fiber per day. Seems like a lot, but the reason for that is because prostate cancer is very common amongst men and fiber can help prevent that. Um, sodium, 2,400 milligrams, like I said. So what's the right amount? Again, it gets more specific than that. And this is where a doctor or a dietitian would analyze someone's diet and say, well, you're having bone density problems. Let's up your calcium intake, right? Uh, we are not doing that. They are doing that as a medical approach. That's not what we do. We don't do a medical approach, right? We do an educational approach. Um, so I could tell somebody, it's like, well, you might see improved benefits by increasing your calcium intake, right? I said might, right? I didn't tell them to eat more calcium. It's not my role, not my job. Um, so nutrition, uh, claims that you're going to see on food labels, you will sometimes see things that'll say low fat, reduced sugar, high in fiber. Uh, you'll see this all the time where it'll say like, you know, um, let's look at this soup here. Uh, and it says it's us. Well, that's actually fine. It's vegan and gluten-free, you know, um, <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily mean that it's healthy. You know what I mean? Uh, remember, Oreos are vegan. <laughs> uh, trans fat free. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Added fiber. It's immunity boosting. Now, all of these things, immunity boosting, right? What does that mean? What do you mean my cereal is immunity boosting? Well, it probably has some vitamin C in it. And vitamin C has been shown to have some positive benefits. What about like uh, Cheerios? right? Can help lower your cholesterol. They put a little asterisk there. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> fiber has been shown to reduce cholesterol. Oreos have fiber in it. Therefore, they get to put that on their nutrition label. But here's what they don't tell you. The amount of fiber found in a bowl of Cheerios Uh, four grams <laughs> out of the 30, the 30 to 40 that we need per day. Um, so is it really going to help lower your cholesterol? Probably not. We probably need a little bit more cholesterol, but they can say it. 
because it's not a statement that's been approved by the FDA. The FDA cares about them, you know, being truthful about what is in their food. The ingredients label, the nutrition facts panel, that all has to be true. The claims of like, you know, healthy or helps lower your cholesterol, stuff like that doesn't have to be true. They can say whatever they want. So those health claims, right, uh, uh, don't have to be substantiated by the FDA. Um, you'll see stuff that says like, you know, we know that calcium is related to osteoporosis. So if something's high in calcium, it might be like, hey, it can fix your osteoporosis, right? And it's like, we know that's not necessarily true, even though there's a correlation. This is the difference between correlation and causation. Having calcium in your diet is not going to cause you, you know, uh, uh, to <clears throat> cure your osteoporosis, even if there is a correlation between the two. Sodium and hypertension are related. Dietary fat is related to cancers and, and hypertension uh, and cholesterol. Uh, saturated fat is reduced with is, you know, cholesterol and heart disease. Fiber is associated with fighting cancers and things like that. Uh, fruits and vegetables have reduced our risk of coronary heart disease. Why? Again, they're full of vitamins. They're full of fiber, right? Um, uh, so we do know that there are some connections here. We're going to look more at these connections when we look into our nutrients in particular. Um, but if we're applying all of this stuff, one of the big things that we're talking about is assessing our clients' readiness for change and figuring out where they are. Now, I'm going to move through this quickly because we're going to see this better in a couple, in I think tomorrow, actually. Um, but we need to assess whether or not our client is actually able to change their diet. Not everybody can be able to, you know, at least not right away. Like not everybody's ready to jump into a new diet plan and jump into a new workout program. That's what's, this is why people don't understand, uh, you know, why addicts have such a hard time, like, you know, when they fall off the wagon, right? Uh, it's because like, they don't understand that like not everybody is ready to make like a big change in their life at any given time. They need, you, you know, you need to go through like specific steps and processes, right? Like I could go down to the street right now and be like, Hey, I can teach you to be a really good personal trainer. But if that person's not like ready for that, they're like, well, I'm not interested, you know? Um, but if they start to learn the benefits and they start to see themselves being able to do it, then it slowly changes their worldview. And then, yeah, maybe they, you know, maybe they will do something like that. Right. Um, so that's part of the coaching and that's some of the coaching stuff that we're going to be talking about in this class as like a nutrition coach, you need to understand that not everybody's ready to just change their meal plan right away. So we're going to start with small baby steps. One of my favorite things to do is just to tell my clients to try to eat more colorfully. You do that, it's pretty good advice. It'll get you a pretty long ways. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at later in this course. And that's a general summary of everything we're going over um, over the next uh, uh, week or so. So sports nutrition, obviously, we need to know a lot about nutritional uh, information chemically. Um, so we'll be breaking that down and understanding our six essential nutrients uh, and their components, how they work. Uh, we, need, we understand that like the body is obviously getting its energy from primarily carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Uh, and we need to understand those energy needs because if we have too much of it, we're gonna gain weight. If we have too little of it, we're gonna lose weight and waste away. Not good. Um, the MyPlate is a really good system that we are going to get super familiar with uh, and, you know, try to be able to incorporate and, and try to eat like that as often as possible. Uh, and then we will talk about how to develop individualized sports nutrition programs, just not prescribed to our clients. We're going to get, write generally healthy programs. Uh, and that's about it today, guys. Um, yeah, that is all I got for you. That's 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 a that's a broad overview of where we're headed over the next week. <clears throat> Any uh, questions, comments, or concerns? Anybody worried about anything? I didn't get to, or maybe it wasn't clear. No, oh, everything I, I I understood everything. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, um. Well, all right. Let me. Uh,